Hey, what's up you guys? Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today, we'll be discussing the life of Sheila Bellish. She was a 35-year-old woman who was sadly ripped away from her family way too soon. Sheila's story is a cautionary tale and based on my research and a little that I know about her, I think she'd want others to learn from her story. There is a ton of information to cover in this case, so grab a drink and buckle in because it's going to be a wild ride. I'm going to be discussing Sheila's family in depth. If you'd like to skip forward through any of these details, there'll be timestamps in the description. However, I feel that the backstory is essential in this case, so I'll be going back to the beginning. Sheila's mother, Verma Jean Williams, was born and raised in Biloxi, Mississippi. Her parents were Clintus and Charles Williams, though her mother primarily raised her because her father was murdered when she was only a few years old. Growing up in the Depression era, Jean learned early that she would have to work hard to succeed. Her mother eventually remarried, and she watched her mother and stepfather struggle to survive. They eventually purchased a trailer park, but they still weren't rich. She had big dreams of one day leaving that life behind. She wanted to grow up, fall in love, and get married and have a family. She promised herself that she'd provide more for her children than what she had growing up, and Jean would one day keep that promise despite the many obstacles that she faced. By most people's standards, she was beautiful with fair skin and intense blue eyes, so falling in love would never be the issue. Staying in love wouldn't be so easy though. When Jean was only 15, she met an 18 year old airman named Dwayne Anderson. Their relationship basically moved and fast forward. They got married in the late 1940s and welcomed their first child in the same year, a baby boy named Danny. The following year, they had another boy named Donnie. Though their son's birth was supposed to be a happy time for Jean and Dwayne, the marriage proved to be more complicated than they had ever anticipated. Bills were piling up and the responsibility of two children took its toll. The two separated shortly after the birth of their second child, but Jean was determined not to let her failed marriage define her. She was determined not to rely on her ex-husband, so she got a job as a waitress and eventually learned to bartend. She worked long hours and took care of her kids in between shifts. Dating was the last thing on her mind, but it didn't take long until she met another man who swept her off her feet. During one of her shifts at the bar, she met a man who was a fighter pilot for the Air Force. He was from up north, but was stationed in Mississippi at the time. Though he was only 22 years old and younger than her, Frank seemed promising. Jean also found him to be very handsome and charming. He came from a prestigious family in Connecticut and had an easier childhood than Jean had. Despite their differences, he didn't seem to be bothered that she had been divorced or that she had the responsibility of raising two little boys. Frank deployed shortly after he and Jean began dating, but she didn't mind waiting on him. She continued to work and care for her kids, afraid to ever rely on a man again. When he returned, he received the news that he'd be restationed in Topeka, Kansas. They were forced to make a decision. Either Jean, Danny, and Donnie would go with him or they would break up. The two ultimately decided to stay together. They decided to get married so that they could all move with him. Think Things were going great for the Walshes in the beginning. They were living on the Keebler Air Force Base in Topeka. In July of 1961, shortly after they married and moved to Topeka, the two welcomed their first child together. Mary Catherine was their first little girl. The following year, they welcomed their second baby girl named Sheila Lee Walsh. She was born on October 19, 1962. Unlike her previous three children, Jean worried deeply for Sheila's health. She was tiny and suffered from many health issues following her birth, but Sheila was strong-willed and feisty from birth despite these challenges. Jean and Frank welcomed their third child together, another little girl named Kellyanne, in November of 1963. Sadly, Kellyanne was born with a severe congenital disability that affected her heart valve, and she lived to be only 19 days old. Old. Losing Kellyanne had a catastrophic impact on their family. Jean developed chronic depression and was drowning in sorrow for years following the baby's death. She would have what she described as emotional outbursts, and sometimes even minor things in life felt too overwhelming for her. 
Jean's depression took over and consumed her. Frank seemed to go in the opposite direction. The responsibility of caring for his wife and children became too much to handle. Rather than processing his grief, he turned to alcohol. He started drinking more often than before and was gone more than he was home. Frank soon received the news that the family would be restationed in South Dakota. While it seemed like an opportunity to begin again, it only made things worse. Jean had grown used to Frank being away from home and accustomed to running their household and taking care of the kids without him, and she preferred it that way. Frank's absence meant there was no intimacy, which meant she didn't have to worry about pregnancy while he was gone. When he returned home from training, she couldn't bear the thought of losing another child, so she went and got on birth control. The doctor implanted an IUD, and she was prescribed oral birth control, but it wasn't long before both contraceptives failed her, and Jean became pregnant once again. She was terrified. Because of the IUD, the doctor warned her that she might miscarry once it was removed. If the baby did survive, there was a chance that it would have congenital disabilities or other issues. She was trapped. She never wanted another baby to begin with, but now that she had conceived, she didn't want to lose this baby too. She was paralyzed by the thought that she may have to watch her child suffer through a life riddled with disabilities. It felt like there was no way out but through. In the 1960s, women didn't have safe ways to terminate their pregnancies, but I'm not sure she would have gone through with it either way. Jean and Frank welcomed their fourth child together in June of 1967. It was a little girl whom they named Carrie and she was born completely healthy. Even though that was great news, the entire family was skeptical. It was like they were all waiting for something to go wrong. Donnie, Jean's older son, refused to even hold Carrie or come near her out of fear that she would be ripped away from them the same way that Kellyanne had been. Sheila seemed to be the only person in the family who wasn't worried. Despite being five years apart, they were inseparable and their relationship stayed that way for Sheila's entire life. They shared a common interest. They were obsessed with the idea of their daddy. Frank left Jean to handle all of the responsibilities, such as keeping up with the house and disciplining the children, and he got to play the fun parent when he was home. They were never in trouble with their dad, and he acted as if they could do no wrong. He was their hero, but Frank's real superpower was disappearing. He'd come home and take them fishing or hiking, but then he was gone again. Jean finally got fed up with this cycle and asked Frank for a divorce. He remarried a woman named Barbara just before he was deployed for Vietnam, while Jean and the kids moved back to Biloxi and started over once again. Frank would occasionally visit, which the girls loved, but he saw them even less than before. With five children to feed, she was forced to work two jobs just to make ends meet, and she made it look easy. She would wake up early and work the breakfast shift at their small town diner till about 2 p.m. every day. She'd then head home and start laundry and cook dinner before returning for the night shift at the Ramada Inn. If she was lucky, she got a nap in between shifts, but she didn't have much time for sleep in those days. Her her busy schedule didn't stop her from drawing attention from men around her. In 1970, she met a man named Don Smith, and the two quickly started their relationship. He was also a fighter pilot in the Air Force, but he was different than the two men that Jean had married before. He was even-tempered and well-mannered, with a heart of gold. He didn't drink much, and being a bit older than Jean, he had already lived a full life. He didn't mind that she had children because he had two adult children and had helped raise his first wife's two kids. Though Don was a great man, Jean had already decided that she wouldn't marry a man employed by the United States government. She expressed this to him and he retired. She was impressed by his dedication and she agreed to marry him. Though they got married when Sheila was already nine years old, she and the rest of the kids considered him to be their real dad. The family moved to Arizona so that Don could open a peach orchard and they began again. About five months into Frank's deployment, the plane he was on was taken down and there were no survivors. He died only two days before Christmas and his death was especially hard on Sheila and Carrie. They could barely understand what happened, let alone accept it. Surprisingly, his death was difficult on Jean as well. He was the father of her children and in some way, it made her felt widowed and grief stricken, even though she had married Don. The sadness quickly turned into rage when she received a letter from a woman in Okinawa who claimed that she had a long-term relationship with Frank for many years while he was married to Jean. 
Eventually, Don, Jean, and the kids relocated once again to Salem, Oregon. Don opened a construction business, and between his military retirement fund and the money he was bringing in from the company, they were doing well financially. Jean finally got to stay home and care for the kids, and because they were getting older and were in school, she had more time to do the things that she wanted to do for the first time in her life. Sheila began her freshman year at Sprague High School. She's described as intelligent, detail-oriented, and Anne was taking accelerated college prep classes. She had the smarts, and combined with Jean's work ethic, that meant she was destined to be something great. She excelled in high school, and as soon as she graduated, she began taking business classes at Chimikita College in Salem. Things seemed to be going well for the Walsh Smiths, but it wouldn't be long before their lives were flipped upside down once again. While out camping, Donnie contracted Lyme disease and became very ill. His symptoms lasted for months, and it took a toll on his mental health. According to Gene, he was never the same again. He had frequent mood swings and was withdrawn from his family, and was even manic depressive at some points. When he ran away, Don and Gene felt that they needed to do something to help straighten his life out. They encouraged him to join the military, which he eventually agreed to, but this unfortunately only made things worse when he was shipped off to boot camp. He completely cracked under the pressure. The abuse only intensified his depression, and Donnie soon began self-medicating. When in boot camp, he somehow learned how to build things that go boom, if you know what I mean, and was caught on base with that device. The army felt that he needed to be discharged due to this mental state and sent him home immediately. He continued to self-medicate once he was back in Oregon, and eventually felt that he wanted to... Himself. He recognized the destructive path he was on and rode his bicycle for 20 miles to the VA hospital and asked them for help. Sadly, they turned him away and he took his own life only two days later, one day after Thanksgiving. Donnie was the second child that Jean lost in November and sadly, he wouldn't be her last. She felt that the month was cursed and every year it broke her heart all over again. The family was forced to pick up the pieces once again. During all of this, she Sheila landed a job working as an administrative assistant at the law offices of Brown, Burt, Swanson, Lathan, Alexander, and McCann. She was only 18 years old and still in college, but the law intrigued her. She enjoyed her job and found their high-profile cases, such as the I-5 killer case, to be very interesting. She had dreams of attending law school one day, but no one could have predicted how quickly that dream would diminish when she met her first serious boyfriend, Alan Van Hoot. Before we discuss their relationship, I wanted to discuss Alan's earlier life. He had a lengthy history of problems that Sheila was oblivious to when they first met. A history that, if she would have known about, she probably would have run from. Let's talk about Alan's upbringing. Each of his parents grew up in challenging circumstances themselves. His father, Guy, came from a long line of educators who expected nothing less than excellence. Guy's mother walked out on him and his sister when he was only three years old. His father remarried a few years later and had more children, while his older two were tossed aside. His grandparents raised him while his sister was sent away to boarding school. Aside from difficult family life, he was sickly as a child and his appearance suffered. He was bullied and his social life suffered. So when he met Alan mother, Karen, he was surprised that she was interested in him at all. But Karen came with her own set of problems that were even worse than Guy's. Karen was born to her mother, Elva, and father, Zachariah, when Elva was only 15 years old. Zachariah was a grown man and preacher who handpicked Elva to be his wife, despite her being a literal child. Somehow, her parents signed off on this, and the couple had a few children together. Elva divorced him as soon as possible, but not before Zachariah had the chance to abuse daughters the same way he had abused Elva. He eventually moved to Oklahoma, but that didn't make life any less difficult. <clears throat> I want to add that this guy was a literal piece of sh Despite being a preacher and heavily involved with Christianity and the church, he took it upon himself to teach children the birds and the bees by demonstrating it for them. And I don't think he was ever held accountable for these crimes. Elva eventually remarried a quiet farmer named Austin, and they had two more children together. He was a gentle, hardworking man who was determined to provide for his family. 
They purchased their own plot of land in Stanfield, Oregon, and they had plenty of animals and crops. It seemed that it would be a nice place to settle down and raise their children, but Karen and her sister Violet were a handful. Elva was completely disconnected from her older children, likely because they were products of forced marriage and sexual abuse. It was challenging for her to deal with them or show them any affection at all. It took its toll and Karen developed severe mental health issues in her teen years. Austin tried to be a father to them, but the harder he tried, the more they rebelled. Karen had severe mood swings and would sneak out of the house anytime that she could. She would take her temper out on everyone around her and her younger siblings were afraid of her. She would frequently threaten to herself, though there was no evidence she ever attempted it. When Karen and Guy met in high school, she was 16 and a sophomore, and he was 19 and a senior. The two seemed to be head over heels for each other, although for very different reasons. Guy was invested in Karen for all of the reasons high school boys are typically invested, while Karen believed they were in love. Her parents thought he would be a great influence on her, so he essentially had unlimited access to her. They were thrilled when he asked for permission to take Karen to California and get married during the summer before Karen's junior year. However, they all failed to realize that Guy wanted to get married for all of the wrong reasons. It was a big f you to his dad and so that he could avoid going to college. Karen wanted to get married to have the freedom to live in her own home away from her parents. Neither of them were prepared for the responsibility that they had just taken on. Karen unexpectedly became pregnant a few months later, and it did not go well. Guy went to work at a sawmill and a cannery to make ends meet. It wasn't long before he realized that he made a big mistake by marrying Karen. While she was pregnant, the two began to fight constantly, and it was too much for him to handle, so he left. He filed for divorce and agreed to attend college, leaving Karen to take care of their newborn baby by herself. She was only 17 and had already been married, divorced, and had a a baby. Guy had no intentions of ever coming back and helping raise his son. William Allen Van Hoot was born on June 5th, 1955 in Eugene, Oregon. Karen was alone during the delivery, which was only the beginning of how difficult things would be. She was still living on her own at the time and she did everything she could to avoid having to move back home with her parents. Guy came back to visit Allen only once after his birth, but he felt he made no connection to him and decided never to return. He also refused to help Karen financially and child support wasn't a law back then. She was ultimately forced to move back home, and that's when her resentment towards Guy and Alan began. She felt that having Alan ruined her life and took away her freedom, and he felt her wrath because of that. Despite Elva never acting motherly toward Karen, she felt sorry for her grandson and took him under her wing. She was loving and adoring toward him and was determined to make up for his mother's neglect. As Alan grew, he turned into an adorable little boy. The family described him as looking like alfalfa from the little rascals cow look and all he was brilliant but would often encourage other kids to get in trouble he could be vindictive and would often cause marital issues between elva and austin it seemed that he loved turmoil which was a trait that karen couldn't stand eventually karen moved out again but alan was shuffled back and forth between elva's and karen's for most of his childhood however he preferred to be on the farm because his mother would beat him him severely when he was in her care. Karen remarried a few years later and had more children. One of them was tragically killed by a car accident and her grief only made her more violent. She started abusing alcohol and sometimes showed up on the farm demanding that they give Alan back. At one point, authorities removed Alan from her care due to her negligence. His Aunt Debbie had shown up at Karen's house to check on Alan because Elva was worried for him. When she arrived, he was outside doing heavy manual labor, which Karen often used as punishment. She could see that he didn't feel well, and he told her that he had been ill for several days. Despite this, Karen had forced him to cut down trees in that condition for days. Debbie took him to the hospital, and he wound up having hepatitis and was hospitalized for a week. He had permanent liver damage due to this incident. Another time, Karen allegedly poured lighter fluid on his hand and threatened to light him on fire if he didn't stop leaving the stove on. She would also beat him with boards and use any extreme punishment that she could. At another point, she took her children to visit her biological father, despite his alleged abuse toward children. Many years later, Alan claimed that he had been sexually abused 
as a child, and it was likely at the hands of his biological grandfather. Karen was an incredibly toxic person to her spouses as well as her children. There was a lot of domestic violence, and the kids suffered the most. Meanwhile, Guy didn't learn his lesson with his first marriage, and soon married another woman named Jeanette, immediately following his divorce from Karen. She was also only 16, while he was 20 at the time. Not surprisingly, he got her pregnant right away, and the two ended up having four children together. Their marriage lasted about five years before he decided to divorce Jeanette. Not surprisingly, he took zero responsibility for his kids and abandoned his family once again. Thankfully, they were adopted by Jeanette's second husband eventually. It didn't take long for Guy to move on and start a new family once again. He married a woman named Suzanne in 1961, and they had three boys together named Bruce, Randy, and Nick. And apparently, the third marriage is the charm because he decided to stick it through this time. Though, he failed to tell Suzanne about his previous marriages or his five children. She didn't find out until several years later when Alan showed up on their doorstep looking for his father. Back on the farm, Alan was creating more and more issues for the family. He would seek out ways to create an argument between his grandparents to the point that they nearly got a divorce. His Aunt Debbie had gotten married and moved to California, and when he was 15, he showed up on their front doorstep and said, I'm here to live with you. He was sick of living on the farm. They felt sorry for him and decided to take him in. Everyone was shocked, though, because he had left without even saying goodbye to his grandmother, who he was very close with. He never went back to visit her before she died, either. He started creating problems for Debbie right away. He began stealing from them, but she tried to be understanding and guide him in a better direction. When he wanted to search for his father, they were supportive despite having doubts about the outcome. It didn't take long for Alan to track Guy down. They quickly developed a relationship, and it didn't take long before Alan moved in with Guy and his new family. Debbie and her husband discouraged the move, and Suzanne wasn't on board either, but Guy insisted. Alan quickly bonded with his brothers, but it wouldn't be long before they grew afraid of them the same way that Karen's younger siblings were once afraid of her. He would invent games that were often violent and would get other people or animals hurt. Now, as I mentioned earlier, he had this persuasiveness and the ability to manipulate people into doing things that they wouldn't normally do. He would take butcher knives and go after neighborhood children and even held them to his brother's throats. At one point, he asked a girl out that lived in the neighborhood. She agreed, but he tried to coerce her into doing things that she didn't want to do on the first date. When she refused, he grew angry and choked her before trying to force himself on her. Thankfully, she was able to get away, but that wouldn't be the first of Alan's misbehaviors. After he moved in, Suzanne noticed her underwear were going missing. She was convinced that Alan was stealing them, but when she brought it up to Guy, he thought she was crazy. Alan would be visibly excited when Suzanne and Guy argued. After witnessing an argument, he told her that he would break them up no matter what it took. She demanded that Alan move out, but they remained in his life for the next several years. I want to mention that it's confirmed that Alan would wear clothing deemed for women for sexual pleasure. I'm not here to judge anyone's kinks, but stealing your stepmother's underwear is predatory, in my opinion. Suzanne wasn't crazy. Despite being in high school, he got a part-time job and moved into his apartment. He attended church and met a girl named Ellen at a Bible study. They were high school sweethearts, but it seemed that Ellen liked that he could control her. She was quiet, mousy, pretty, but didn't realize that she was. Her low self-esteem meant that Alan could easily manipulate and control her. They got married shortly after they graduated and joined the army together. They had found a program that would allow them to stay together through the training, but they were discharged a few months later for unknown reasons. They joined a religious movement called the Unification Church of the United States, where Alan allegedly laundered money for them for a while. Later in life, he joined the group called The True Answer, which was a small religious cult as well. In these groups, he learned to be a great salesman and also learned to make elaborate lies sound believable. In these groups, he learned how much he liked money and what you could accomplish with it. As he learned how to impress other women, he grew more and more of toward Ellen. She endured his brutality for five years. At one point, he beat their dog to for peeing on the carpet after it had been left alone for two days. Ellen took off, and when she returned, he was smiling and watching TV as if he were proud of himself for what he had done. 
Throughout their marriage, Alan would invite his brothers over and force Alan to do sexual things in front of them. Naturally, they were uncomfortable by this, but Alan claimed that she was just into it. Eventually, they just stopped coming over altogether, but the abuse continued. He would force her to tie his hands up and hold his head underwater until he passed out. When she'd panic and pull his head out of the water too soon, he would get mad and hit her for ruining his orgasm. He'd dress in her clothing and make her drop him off across town because he got a thrill out of trying to get home without being caught. The worst of his abuse happened when Ellen became pregnant with Alan's first child. He forced her to place the baby up for adoption. When she became pregnant again, he beat her and kicked her in her stomach so brutally that she was afraid the baby would be disabled. She decided to have an abortion and left him shortly after. He wasn't single for long. Shortly after his divorce from Ellen, he met another woman named Mary, and the two hit it off. By that point, Alan was working with his father selling dance floors during the disco era. Mary had two young kids, and she initially believed that he'd be a fantastic role model. He came across as successful and genuine, but she really had no clue what she was getting herself into. Alan had learned to hide away the qualities that he didn't want others to see. He turned his mean streak on and off whenever he saw fit. He and Mary got married in 1979, but it started on a rocky note. On the night of their wedding, he left for a two-week business trip to Taiwan. Mary wasn't happy about this, but accepted that it was something that Alan had no control over, and she let it slide. He planned on creating his own stereo business called Capital Hi-Fi, and the two-week business trip turned into nine months that he was gone. The distance and constant lies created a strain on the marriage, and Mary soon started to suffer from his abuse once he returned. She decided that she needed to get a divorce within the first year of their marriage, but stuck around for another two afterward because she was afraid to leave. Alan threatened that if she were ever to leave him, he would kill her and her children. She believed him, but they were able to finally escape when she packed their belongings and headed to California while Alan was away. Her first stop was at Alan's Aunt Debbie's house before she and the kids disappeared altogether. She filed for divorce and they settled down into town where she hoped that Alan wouldn't find her. Years later, Mary was working at a restaurant that Debbie happened to stop in. When Mary realized that Debbie was there, she begged her never to tell Alan where she was. She promised that she wouldn't and stayed true to her word. Mary and her kids had successfully gotten away from Alan. They made it out alive, but Alan's next wife wouldn't be so fortunate. When Mary filed for divorce, Alan only cared about protecting his assets. He sought legal representation at the law offices of Brown, Burt, Swanson, Lathan, Alexander, and McCann. If you remember, that's where Sheila was working when she was only 20 years old. The two were introduced, and there was an instant attraction, despite their age difference and Alan's pending divorce. He was 27, but Sheila liked how sophisticated and mature Alan seemed to be. He asked her out on a date, she agreed, and the rest was pretty much history. Alan swooped in on Sheila very quickly, and she sadly was naive and believed that he was a great catch. Alan asked Sheila to marry him by their third date, and she surprisingly agreed. Sheila was still living with Jean and Don at the time, but Alan had no qualms about moving in with them. He acted as if he were excited to be part of their family, and the Smith family really loved him at first. He seemed to be so genuine and kind-hearted, though he was quiet about his past. Gene loved that Alan quoted the Bible and seemed to be well-mannered. He was never open about his childhood, and Sheila felt that he was being secretive about his past. She overlooked that red flag, though, because she truly believed that Alan was her soulmate and only wanted to see the best in him. Her younger sister, Carrie, wasn't so sure about her future brother-in-law, though. She saw through his bullshit a lot faster than the rest of the family because he really showed his true colors with her. While living with the Smiths, he and Sheila slept in separate bedrooms, you know, because he was a godly man and he took Carrie's room over temporarily. She was only 15 years old at the time and was obsessed with the massive stereo that Alan had put in her room. While he wasn't home, she would often sneak in there to listen to music, but she'd always leave before he returned. One day, she accidentally fell asleep in his room and was shocked when she awoke to find Alan lying on top of her. She told him to get off of her and he responded, Oh, it's okay. We're just keeping it in the family. 
She was thankfully able to escape him, but she was so shaken up that she decided not to tell anyone what happened. She felt as if no one would believe her and was concerned about hurting her older sister. She kept it to herself for years, but she could never shake that uneasy feeling that she felt every time she was around Alan. Sheila and Alan wed on February 4th, 1983 in Salem. They had a beautiful ceremony and Sheila truly believed that they were about to begin their happily ever after. Alan was the man of her dreams and she felt lucky to have found a love like that at only 22 years old. He was smart, successful, and hardworking. It wouldn't take long before his lies started to unravel though and people would start to realize what kind of person Alan really was. But by then, it seemed like it was far too late. That's all I got for you in part one. Be sure to join me in part two, where we'll be discussing the rest of Sheila's story and the literal nightmares that Alan caused for her. As always, thank you for watching, and remember the name, Casey Shane. I'm out. Oh my